Hey everybody, it's Grandmaster Ben Feingold here with another video in our series, Forgotten Players. We've actually modified the name of the series because some of the viewers were getting confused. They thought great players of the past and forgotten players of the past were very similar or the same kind of lectures. Um, actually, great players of the past generally was people who were in the top five in the world at some point or even better even world champions um, or people who played world championship matches and are very well known to almost anybody who plays in chess tournaments or plays online a lot. The people that are in the Forgotten Players, the new name of the series, um, most people never heard of them, even though they were probably top 10, top 20 in the world. This is a really good example of a forgotten player, Rudolf Chirauzik. He basically played chess in the 1890s and that was it, but he had a good excuse um, he didn't live very long, and this happened with a lot of players, I think, between um, 1800 and 1940. There were a lot of very strong players who died in their 20s, 30s, and 40s who didn't really have a chance to have a big chess career. Chirauzik actually died, uh, unfortunately, at the age of 26 of tuberculosis. It says he was a Czech-born Hungarian chess player um, on Wikipedia, now, Chirauzik was definitely one of the top 10 players in the world in the 1890s, and some people feel he was in the top five. Um, I'll let you guys decide. You can look at this one game. You're really going to enjoy it, and then you can go on the internet and look up some more of his games. His name was Rudolf Rez Rezzo Chirauzik. So anyway, Chirauzik's playing world chess champion Emmanuel Lasker. Um, I gave Lasker's full name, so you didn't think that he was playing uh, Edward Lasker, which would be an easier opponent. In 1896, most people would have said Emmanuel Lasker was the best player in the world. So, okay, maybe I've just seen this game. So Chirauzik played the King's Gambit, which he liked to do. And he played Bishop C4, which is less common than Knight F3. Although in the 1990s and early 2000s, when... Uh, well, in the late 1980s also, when Judah Polgar played the King's Gambit quite often, she liked to play Bishop C4. Uh, Lasker played D5, sacrificing a pawn back to get more development and misplace the bishop. Now the bishop on C8 has a lot of squares. Knight F6 gains a tempo on the bishop. This is typical. Now, when I had black in the King's Gambit, my opponents played Bishop C4, which is pretty rare, I would play knight f6 in this position. That's my recollection from over 30 years ago studying this line. Uh, Lasker played queen h4 check, which is always very tempting when they don't play knight f3. It's a big argument whether the king is more misplaced on f1 or the queen is more misplaced on h4 because black is going to lose another tempo once white plays knight f3, but white can't castle. So... Okay, g5, protecting the f-pawn forever, or so he thought. Knight f3, the queen moves back. h4, very aggressive move, which actually doesn't have a threat. We can't take with the h-pawn for white, because then the rook would be hanging. We can't take with the knight, because the queen is hanging. So h4, for the moment, doesn't threaten anything. Although if black plays g5, I'm sorry, g4, we could play knight g5, threatening the f-pawn. And taking on h4 doesn't make any sense for black because then he's going to lose all these pawns. Okay, so he played bishop g7, developing a piece. Knight c3 does defend the queen on d1. So now maybe knight takes g5 as a threat. c6 attacking the bishop. Bishop moves back. I mean, for me, I would more likely play bishop b3 to be safer. But bishop c4 has some other advantages. Sometimes we play bishop e2. And I guess... Could play b4, b5 if he castles queenside. Okay, bishop c4 is okay. Bishop g4 pins the knight. White gets the nice center that he wants in the king's gambit. That's the point of the king's gambit. Get rid of that pawn on e5 and play d4. Knight d7. Very interesting game so far because I haven't seen this kind of position yet. And it looks really fascinating. King f2. Now the queen and rook are connected and protect each other. So now we can play h takes g5 because the rook is protected by the queen. So black has to do something. Takes, takes, and he castle queen side. It doesn't look like black's going to want to castle king side in this position. Okay, unfortunately for, for Lasker, his king side falls apart now. 
and everything that black wants in a king's gambit has happened. Um, I hope I said white. Everything white wants in a king's gambit has happened. I think I said white. He has the nice center. He has the two bishops. And he's going to win back his pawn on f4 eventually. That's really weak. All these pawns are very weak. And I can't really say what black has. Black doesn't have a lot. Okay, his queen's attacked. So he takes the pawn. Knight e2. Putting tremendous pressure on the, on the f pawn. Queen goes back to e7. Um, now in this position, um, I was surprised by the move that uh, Chirauzik played, but it worked out really well. Um, he knew the f pawn was indefensible. I think most of us would just take the f pawn, but he played c3, which is probably better because you get this line of pawns, the pawn chain against this bishop, and you really solidify your center. So I think if nobody does anything over the next five or ten moves, White's just winning. White's going to take the pawn on f4 which then he'll be a pawn up. Black has the two isolated pawns left on the king's side. White has the two bishops. And white has this beautiful center. So I, looks like Lasker's just completely lost. So he plays for tricks. He plays knight e5. The d pawn is pinned. So um, I would probably likely move my bishop here, something like bishop b3. Tarazic played queen a4. Now he's actually threatening the knight on e5. If the knight moves randomly, the a7 pawn is hanging. If you play b5 with a fork, which looks good, I'm pretty sure queen a6 check is, is just winning. So he took the bishop, which I guess is forced. And again, the f pawn is indefensible. So took it. White's up a pawn. White has the better pawn structure. White has the better center. I, I got nothing to say about black's position. Black's just lost. Knight d7. Queen a4 threatening the pawn on a7 again. Queen a5 threatening queen c7 mate. Always play knight f8. Knight g3. Chirauzik knew even in 1896. Always play knife f5. Now, I say this in a lot of my videos, and I mean it. When a weaker player beats a stronger player, or so you think, a lot of times... Since chess is such a difficult game, it doesn't mean the weaker player played better than the stronger player and you're scratching your head thinking, why is that guy the stronger player? He doesn't look like the stronger player. A lot of times what happens is the stronger player plays as well or better than the weaker player and then the stronger player makes a one-move blunder. If you hang mate and one, doesn't matter if you're the stronger player, you hung mate and one. If you hang your queen, you're down a queen. So a lot of times a weaker player can beat a stronger player in chess just because of one really bad move. However, in games like this, I'm like, well, wait a minute. Lasker was the world champion. Who's Chirauzik? Who's that? And Chirauzik just outplays Lasker the whole game. He gets a better center, better development, better pawn structure. His king's safer. His rook on h1 is much better than the rook on h8. This looks like white is a much better player than black, just looking at this position. It wasn't like black hung a knight and went, oh no, I'm going to lose, I'm down a knight. This looks like white just outplayed black and black needs some chess lessons. But that's not the case. Black's the world champion. So you can see how strong Chirauzik was, and it's unfortunate that he died so young, and that's why most people haven't heard of him. Okay, the game was wrapped up pretty quickly since black has no hope. He played knight e6 attacking the bishop. Knife f5. Bishop retreats to g3. I mean, black has no hope here. Rook d7. He takes everything. Now he's threatening queen b8 mate. So you have to trade queens. That was his point because now when you trade queens, you can't save your h-pawn. This is sort of a nice finishing tactic from Chirauzik. Instead of winning slowly, he takes, forcing the recapture, threatens queen b8 mate, forcing the trade. His rook is attacked. Once he moves his rook, he loses his h-pawn. Then he's down two pawns. So he plays f6, breaking the important rule, never play f6. If he moves his rook, rook takes h7 and whites up two pawns for nothing. Now he's still up two pawns for nothing. Okay, rook h6, defending the, the bishop on f6. In this position, 
just to show you why I'm not a great player of the past or a forgotten player, I was wondering what black, what white would do on knight g8. And I was like, man, knight g8 looks pretty good. Then I realized that's not how knights move. Okay, so that's why he didn't play knight g8. Good analysis by me. Hmm. Okay, knight f4. He attacks the knight. He defends his bishop. He gets his last piece into the game. Rook g8, trying to get counterplay with rook g2 check. Play c4. Now in this position, if black played rook g2, it's not black's turn. King e3, we have knight d5 check. So Chirauzic plays c4. Says, well, if play rook g2 check and I play king e3, well, he got nothing. Okay, so he just retreated his knight. He was going to do that anyway after king e3 since Chirauzic took away that square. King e3. Knight f8, the only way really to save his h-pawn. If white plays rook takes a7, white's three pawns up. Okay, d5, e6, and Lasker's like, all right, that's, that's enough. Okay, so an absolutely crushing victory over the world champion by a relatively unknown player now because he died so young, but clearly one of the top players in the world, Rudolf Chirauzic. I hope you learned a lot about Chirauzic. I know I did. And you can look at some of his other games if you go to the internet. You can look up anybody's games. And, well, this one I like because he beat Emmanuel Lasker, and he beat him pretty badly. If you look at this position, it's very difficult to believe that Black was the world champion for over 25 years and considered one of the 10 greatest players ever. He really got crushed this game. This is Grandmaster Ben Feingold for the Forgotten Player series. Uh, follow me on YouTube. Follow the Chess Club on YouTube, like and subscribe, and follow Karen and me on our Twitch pages. I'll see you next time. Bye.